Today we ask the question, what should Ant-Man's voice sound like when he changes size? If you haven't seen it, Ant-Man is a superhero movie where a man named Scott Lang puts on a specially designed suit that allows him to dramatically change size, down to the size of an ant, you can see him here ne next to a pencil eraser, or he can grow to enormous size, you see him here towering over a huge ship. So as I was watching this movie, I was willing to accept the idea that he's impossibly changing size, but I thought, wait a minute, what would happen to his voice? Shouldn't that change too? So a person's physical size affects the frequencies in their voice, not only the pitch of their voice, not only the pitch of their voice, not only the pitch of their voice, but also the resonance of their voice, the resonance of their voice, the resonance of their voice. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video. First, some clips from the movies to know what we're working with. Absolutely. My days of breaking into places and stealing shit are done. What do you want me to do? I got something kind of big, but I can't hold it very long. On my signal, run like hell. And if I tear myself in half, don't come back for me. Tear himself in half? You sure about this, Scott? I do it all the time. I mean, once. In a lab. And I passed out. I'm the boss, I'm the boss, I'm the boss. I'm the boss. I'm the... Hi, sorry. Hi. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, sorry, I know I'm not a whale. This will just take a second. Hey, that doesn't belong to you. No, no, no. You're embarrassing no. yourself now. Come on, let go. No. Thank you. I'll take this now. So let's reflect on the audio of this movie, keeping in mind that a person's physical size should affect the resonant frequencies of the vocal tract. And we're going to get into the science here. So if you look at a cross section of the vocal tract, you can begin to dig into some of those physical properties. They're measurable and systematic. We can measure these lengths on the order of centimeters and then predict what frequencies there should be in the voice. So let's simplify this. Let's take that vocal tract length and just stretch it out and straighten it out on the screen so that it's easier to work with. The length of a re resonating chamber will uniquely support a specific length of a sound wave, as you can see here. And it'll also support a frequency with exactly half that wavelength. The point being that the endpoints of the wave perfectly align with the endpoints of the resonating chamber. But there is a special complication here in that when you're speaking, the vocal tract is open at one end. That's where your lips are. So we have to adjust our wave functions so that the sound wave is only reaching its peak amplitude at the point of the lips. And in reality, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but we'll leave that on for people who are particularly interested to seek that out on their own. So let's begin to analyze the frequencies in the voice. Here's our vocal tract, simplified of course, so if we continue that sound pressure wave through to completion, we can see that its wavelength, when compared to the original length of the vocal tract, is about four times as long. So this sine wave that you see here in green is going to be the first resonance of the voice. And again, its wavelength is going to be four times the length of the vocal tract. Now the second resonance has a wavelength, shown here in orange, that again reaches its peak right where the lips are. It has a length that's four-thirds the length of the vocal tract. And the third resonance, similarly, has its peak right where the lips are, if you follow that blue wave all the way through. And we're really just seeing the same principle here. So now that we've visualized these wavelengths, we can start calculating what the resonant frequencies should be. This equation involves wavelength, the speed of sound, and the period, which is the time it takes the sound to go through one full cycle, or one full wave. And the beauty of this kind of equation is, if you have two elements known, you can figure out the third element. And we do. We know the wavelength, and we know the speed of sound, or at least we can look it up. And with those in mind, let's find those resonant frequencies. 
we first plug those wavelengths into the equation, and we can also realize that the period is just one over the frequency, as in a sound with 10 hertz frequency repeats 10 times a second, so it repeats every tenth of a second, one over 10. So here's the formula rewritten with that in mind. And here's our speed of sound, 341 meters per second. This varies depending on the temperature and other factors, but it's a pretty good starting estimate. Another formula trick we can do is just switch terms from one side to the other. So if we're dividing by frequency on one side, we could just multiply both sides by frequency and switch it to the other side. So now we have a clean sentence for what we're doing. The resonant frequency is the speed of sound divided by the wavelength. So let's suppose we're dealing with a 17 centimeter vocal tract, and because we're dealing in centimeters, let's express that speed of sound in centimeters as well. We plug those numbers into the formula, and we'd write 34,100 divided by 4 times 17. And the same kind of formula is used for the second resonance and the third. And if you follow out the math here, what you get are numbers that almost perfectly align with 500, 1500, 2500. And we will call these F1, F2, and F3 for the first, second, and third formant frequencies of the vocal tract. And these indeed would be the vocal tract resonances if you just let your vocal tract resonate without hitting any specific vowel. And we'd call that neutral vowel schwa. It's sort of like the sound you'd make if all the stuff fell out of your taco and you just went, uh. So now that we know how to convert vocal tract size to resonant frequencies, we can play around to see where those frequencies would land if you slightly altered the vocal tract size. So for a slightly larger size, we see their frequencies would go down. And this should make sense because we know that huge people have deep frequencies with resonant voices. And of course, by making the vocal tract shorter, we would increase the frequencies. So measuring these frequencies is what gives us the vowel chart, which lays out all the vowel sounds on a grid organized by the first and second formant frequencies. So let's work through how we get this shape of the chart, because some of you might be thinking of different things when I say the word frequency. Here we have a sound spectrum, which shows us the frequencies present in a signal, with frequency going from low to high as we read left to right. All the individual frequency components are called harmonics. They're neat and orderly and evenly spaced, and they're actually not what we've been talking about so far. We've actually been talking about the peaks in the spectrum circled in red. That's where we'd find formant frequencies on the order of 500, 1500, and 2500 hertz. Now each vowel has its own spectral shape with peaks at different frequencies marked here in red. So to demonstrate the way we plot these vowels, let's start with the sound E written as the letter I down there, and we take each of those formant frequencies and find their coordinates on this chart. So the first one lands right there, and the second one would land there on the horizontal axis, and their coordinate is where we'd plot E. And we would just do the same thing for all the other vowels, and now it's just easier to look at this chart on the left and not have to look at all the spectra on the right. So you'll recall that we said that the measurements of the vocal tract, if they changed, would change those formant frequencies. Now it's time to figure out what would happen, visualize it, and listen to it. So let's start with regular size Scott Lang, who I should say is really just regular size Paul Rudd. What I did here was measure his vowels in the movie clip that we heard earlier. Now, not all the vowels are represented in this clip, but it's a pretty good place to start. And of course, I also measured the formant frequencies of Scott's vowels when he shrunk down to tiny size Ant-Man, plotted here in blue. And that's how they look. Not that much different, actually. In fact, any speech scientist working in acoustics would say that this amount of variability is really just noise in the data and just gives some odd pronunciations and context that might have just given him some flair on the screen. Now, what about when Scott turns enormous and towers over the ship? What about then? The vowel space doesn't really look that much different. All these vowels are really overlapping because his voice didn't change in the movie. So I'm beginning to think that we might have a problem here. We know that it shouldn't sound like this, but what should it sound like? Okay, so we Google Paul Rudd and we find out that he's 5 foot 10. All right, so regular size Scott, 5 foot 10, and when he's tiny Ant-Man, well, I mean, I don't have a measurement, but from this screenshot from Endgame, we can compare his height to a pencil eraser, 
which is about three quarters of a centimeter wide. And Ant-Man is about three times as tall as the eraser, as long as we rearrange his knee there to be straight. Okay, so as you can tell, I'm doing these very scientific measurements using object sizes and PowerPoint, but I'm gonna record this as 2.25 centimeters. For Giant Man, I'm not gonna do any measurement because in the second movie, he just told us he grew to be 65 feet. So that's a whopping 1,981 centimeters, and now we can do the math. So regular Scott, assuming a vocal tract size of 17 centimeters, gives us those original numbers 500, 1500, 2500 hertz. Now if we scale the vocal tract proportionally, Tiny Ant-Man should have a vocal tract length of 0.215 centimeters, yielding frequencies above 39,000, 119,000, and 198,000 hertz. Giant Man, conversely, would be so large that his vocal tract would give us very much more manageable frequencies of 45, 135, and 225 hertz. What would that sound like? Well, consider that schwa vowel in the middle of the chart there. Let's listen to a clip of Giant Man speaking to the people in the ship. Ah, uh, sorry, I know I'm not a whale. This will just take a second. Hey, that doesn't belong to you. So if we scaled the frequencies in his voice down to where they should be for a 65-foot tall dude, it would be way off the chart to the upper right because the first frequency would go down and the second frequency would go down. So what did he sound like if we scaled his voice down? Like this. Not very intelligible. But what about the vowel frequencies when he turns into the size of an ant? Well, with the regular frequencies indicated here for scale, we'd see that we need the chart to extend to frequencies so outrageously high that the original chart just collapses into a singularity in the corner there. I mean, not a technical singularity, it's just, you know, it's ant-sized. So, to get a sense of this new chart, I've highlighted in blue the frequency range that a young human with perfectly normal hearing could hear. And at my age, I'm going to guess that I'm working more with the frequencies in this red box. And when you go outside this range, you're producing sounds that could only be heard by, you know, a hedgehog, or maybe a bat, or a bottlenose dolphin. So what would his voice sound like if we scaled it up so that it was more like hedgehog hearing? And of course, if we scaled it up to the frequency that's appropriate for an ant-sized character, the frequency would be so high that no person listening to this video could ever hear it. So clearly the audio for Ant-Man's character in the movies is nothing like this. We can see all this overlap instead of all those very distinct different frequencies for different sizes. So we have to ask, for all these different sizes, why didn't they make the audio reflect his size as he shrank and grew? And you probably already know the answer. It's because if they did that, we wouldn't be able to understand anything he said. So why am I complaining about this? Well, I see it as a missed opportunity for the studio to impress us with an interesting technological problem to be solved in the movie. Instead of ignoring the problem of voice acoustics, why not embrace it and show us how it's overcome? I would have loved to see Hank Pym say, the helmet resamples the audio of your voice in real time and sends an output calibrated to human ears. Then, the sound of your voice is precisely tuned to play out at a rate inversely proportional to the change in your size. That could have been just 12 extra seconds of dialogue, and it would have made me so happy. Forget the shrinking technology. That kind of voice technology would have really impressed me. This video used a lot of resources in the form of, you know, websites, and no internet research would be complete without a visit to Wikipedia. Bill Sardi was the first professor I had for speech acoustics and really set my interest into motion. He taught me using Keith Johnson's textbook, Acoustic and Auditory Phonetics, which I used for this video. The acoustic analysis of speech was done in Prot, which is free software developed by Paul Borsma and David Wienink. The data were plotted in R using ggplot2, developed by Hadley Wickham, and further crafted and animated using the gganimate package developed by Thomas Lynn Peterson. And obviously, the audio and video clips for themselves were produced by Marvel Studios. And honestly, with the pandemic going on right now, 
Where else would I be except alone, at home, trying to stay safe away from work by making videos about the intersection of speech acoustics and Hollywood movies? Acoustic phonetics. Is it a superpower? Only you. Only you. Only you can decide.